So friends, uh, good evening and warm welcome to everyone. I'm Brother Augustine Rongmai, currently doing my philosophy in Chennai. And I shall be your host for today's webinar. Today is also coincidentally the feast of St. John Berkman's, patron saint of all the altar servers and all the Jesuit scholastics, especially those in formation. And therefore I take a moment to wish uh, all the altar boys and girls and also all the Jesuit brothers a very happy feast to you all. And uh, at the very outset, on behalf of all the members of the Digital Jesuits, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all, dear participants, for your generous response and willingness to be part of this webinar today. On the given topic, God's Mechanic, How Scientists and Engineers Make, make Sense of Faith. I think uh, we have participants not only from uh, Southeast uh, or uh, rather South Asian countries, but also from across the globe. We are so glad and delighted. I'm sure we will indeed have a very fruitful time uh, of discussion, debate, interactions, and also gaining more insights regarding the given theme. We have today uh, participants from various walks of life, some religious men and women, some professors, some students, and uh, most, important, uh, most importantly, uh, budding scientists and engineers. A warm welcome to one and all. A very uh, special word of welcome to Brother Guy, the speaker of the day, who willingly agreed to address us today, all the way from Rome. Welcome, brother. Um, before we move further, a gentle reminder to all the participants to kindly mute your audios to avoid any disturbances or any internet glitches in the course of the webinar. Thank you for your uh, cooperation. It is science and technology that have uh, brought us together on such an online platform. And it is religion or rather faith in God that daily sustains each one of us. So therefore with these sentiments uh, and in the same spirit, I now invite the Ahmedabad scholastics of uh, Premal Jyoti to invoke God's uh, blessings on us through their prayer song. Over to you, brothers. I will come to you in the silence. I will lift you from all your fear. You will hear my voice. I claim you as my joy. Thank you, brothers, uh, for leading us into the mood of prayer 
and disposing ourselves and offering up ourselves and this entire session to God, invoking his blessing. Before I invite uh, Brother Jubin to introduce Brother Guy to all the participants, allow me to quote Albert Einstein, and so I quote, science without religion is lame. Religion without science is, is blind. We are all aware and also uh, rather can well remember the controversies and accusations both Copernicus, Galileo and many others had to undergo because of the uh, propositions they made with regard to uh, the faith and the discoveries they made. My intention here is just to give a hint as to how debates, discussions, misunderstandings, uh, interactions, sharing, misinterpretations have always been part and parcel of both the history of uh, both in the history of science and religion. So, therefore, with this note, may I now invite uh, Brother Jubin to introduce Brother Guy, our speaker for today's webinar, to all our participants. Over to you, Jubin. Uh, thank you, Augustine, and a very good evening to everyone. Um, it's so honored to have Brother Guy Consolmango with us, uh, and I am so lucky uh, to have him with the Digital Jesuits. Uh, very recently, I met with Brother Guy in Toronto, where he was addressing the University of Toronto in St. Uh, Mike's University. So, so lucky to have you here once again. So, to speak more about Brother Guy Consolmango, he was born in 1952 in Detroit, Michigan. He obtained his Bachelor of Science in 1974 and Masters of Science in 1975, and his PhD in Planetary Science for the University of Arizona in 1978. From 1978 to 80, he was a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at the Harvard College Observatory and from 1980 to 1983, continued as postdoc and lecturer at MIT. In 1983, he left MIT to join the US Peace Corps, where he served for two years in Kenya, teaching physics and astronomy. Upon his return to the US in 1985, he became an assistant professor of physics at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania where he taught until his entry into the Jesuit order in 1989. He took the vows as a Jesuit brother in 1991 and studied philosophy and theology at Loyola, Loyola University, Chicago and physics at the University of Chicago before his assignment to the Vatican Observatory in 1993. He has co-authored two astronomy books, Turn Left, at Orion and Worlds Apart. He is the author of four books exploring faith and science issues, including The Way to the Dwelling of Light, Brother Astronomer, God's Mechanics, and Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? He, ha he has also edited The Heavens Proclaim Vatican Observatory Publications in 2009. Since 2004, he has been write, writing a monthly column on astronomy from the British Catholic periodical named The Tablet. To be very precise for this evening, Brother Guy Kansulmango was a delegate for the Society of Jesus General Congregation 36. He joined the Maryland Jesuits he is currently an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. We are honored to have you, Brother Guy, amidst us. Once again, a heartly welcome, and I request Brother Guy to lead us into today's topic, God's Mechanics, How Scientists and Engineers Make Sense of Faith. Over to you. Thank you, Jubin, for introducing Brother Guy to us. Uh... I now request uh, Brother Owen Rodriguez to moderate the session. Brother Owen is from Karnataka province uh, and is currently pursuing his philosophy in Chennai. 
who is also very much a scientist and engineer by his qualifications and scientific uh, studies as a Jesuit, a very uh, apt person to moderate the session today. And therefore, over to you, Owen. Yeah, thank you, Augustine. I think uh, I'm audible. All of yes, us are yes, uh, yes. very eagerly waiting to listen to Brother Guy. Let me not take much time. Uh, before that, let me just quote uh, Russell Nelson, who says, there is no conflict between science and religion. Conflict only arises when an incomplete knowledge of either science or religion is there, or both is there. So I think Brother Guy is there for us, today with us, to enlighten us on uh, what he makes sense of faith from a perspective of a scientist. So we are very happy and very eager to listen to you. A request to the participants, we have time after Brother Guy speaks to us at the end to interact with him, to discuss. You can raise your questions and so on. So the floor will be open. You can drop your questions in the chat box or you can raise your hands at the end and we'll give you an opportunity to speak. So over to you, brother. We are eager to listen to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity and chance to see friends old and new. Um, I will take this moment to first state what I think should be obvious to everyone, that there is no conflict between science and religion, because I've got this collar and this MIT ring. I can do it. There have been so many other scientists who are deeply religious who can do it. So I'm not even going to address that question. In fact, if I can correct, August, uh, you mentioned Copernicus, Galileo, and so many others. But if you read your history, Copernicus had no problem with the church. Galileo's problems with the church actually were not about his science. Most people don't know that because most people haven't read the history. And those are the examples you gave because those were the only ones you could find. And yet there's an industry out there trying to sell people the idea that you have to be an atheist to be a scientist. How absurd could that be? It's like saying you had to be an atheist to be able to follow a football game. That's crazy. What I really want to address is not if scientists can be religious, but how are scientists and engineers religious? And I group scientists and engineers together into a group <clears throat> I'm calling techies. So, because they, they work in technology. Now, what do I mean by a techie? <clears throat> this was uh, the, you know, the, the cover of the book that I hoped I would have, but uh, let's see if I can go forward. There we go. What's a techie? Now, a techie is someone who makes their living as an engineer or a scientist. Okay. But it's more than that. It's someone whose orientation to the world is pragmatic, logical, functional, you know, an artist will look at the world and ask, is it beautiful? A philosopher will look and ask, is it true? The techies worldview is, how does it work? Techies see the universe as a, a series of processes to be understood, jobs to be done, problems to be solved. And, you know, okay, there is this great debate about science and religion and how they, they interact. What tends to be overlooked is that there are an awful lot of scientists and engineers who are churchgoers. And even the ones who are not churchgoers are living in a universe that's saturated with religion. And in many ways, they are fascinated by it. I remember once years ago, I was invited to lead a Bible study group. And I thought to myself, I'm Catholic. You know, Protestants do Bible studies. No Catholics don't do that. And it was going to be a Bible study group in Texas. Now, if you know the American geography, Texas is the far south. That's where all the Bible Belt people are. All those, you know, <clears throat> fundamentalists and thinking, there's no way I'm going to do a Bible study in Texas. And then they said, well, this is going to be in the part of Houston where all the astronauts live. And I go, astronauts? I could talk to astronauts, sure. Um, and it turns out, in fact, that half the people there were Catholics, so much for my I thought that Catholics don't do Bible study. But there was one astronaut who was there who was not a Catholic, who was a Baptist fundamentalist. And in very friendly terms, he just reminded me that, you know, I do believe 
that the, in the seven days of creation, just like it says in Genesis. And I'm thinking, has he actually read Genesis? You know, that part where it says the earth is flat and there's a dome and there's water above and below the dome. Where does he think the, the spacecraft go? You know, where does he think the shuttle is flying? How come it doesn't get wet? And then he told me a little more about himself. And he said before he was an astronaut, he was a test pilot. And this dawned on me, ah, I think I'm seeing where he's coming from, because you do not want a test pilot who is in the habit of creatively interpreting his written instructions. You want a test pilot who will do exactly what you tell him to do. That's the way his brain works. On the other hand, this is not a guy that you want to go to an art gallery with. But there are a lot of occupations, especially technical occupations, that being literal is part of the job description. We have to recognize that a lot of people in the world do think that way. But beyond trying to figure out how we can teach these people that scripture was written as poetry, not like the owner's manual to your automobile, we have to recognize that there is a misfit between technologically oriented people and the way that church is, is presented to them. I know in America, we had a lot of immigrants who came to America at the end of the 19th century when my grandparents came to Italy, uh, from Italy to America. And the churches were made up by these people and the people preaching them were immigrants like them and they were able to talk to each other and they understood each other. But nowadays, you know, thanks to Jesuits, we've educated all these people. They've got a very different understanding of how the world works. And an awful lot of them are engineers. And some of them are scientists. And some of them are doctors. And I don't see in our church enough emphasis of how we talk to these techies. So that's really what I want to address today. Because religious instructors, retreat directors, spend a lot of time talking the, about the affective side of our personalities. I guess you guys in, in formation have heard a lot about that, how you, you develop your feelings towards God. And most techies have no idea what that word means. Most techies are just going to hear the words that come out of retreat directors and, and think of it as gibberish. Um, I remember... One fellow who was saying that he was in a retreat and the, the retreat director said, image yourself as a rose. And I guess the idea was, yeah, very pretty, but also full of thorns and very poetic. But the techie is going like, I'm supposed to image a rose? Where's the rose? Where's my camera? You know, what should my exposure be? Completely missing the point. This happens when techies encounter church talk. I'm a Jesuit. And as a Jesuit brother, about uh, 20 years into my formation, 15, 20 years, I was invited to do a program called tertianship. And you Jesuits know what this is. It's kind of the last step of formation before you go on to your final vows. And as part of tertianship, I did a two-month experiment living in Silicon Valley, California, talking to techies. So I would you know, drive up and down uh, the, the 101 freeway from San Jose up to San Francisco. And I started by talking to friends of mine who are scientists and engineers, and then friends that they connected me up with, and then friends of friends, anybody who said they'd be willing to talk to me about religion, whether they believed or not. I took a lot of notes. I probably talked to at least 100 different people. And then I wrote them up. And eventually they sh showed up as the middle part of my book, God's Mechanics, the book that I'm advertising it, you know, with the title of this uh, title of this talk. I talked about 26 of them and I gave their stories in alphabet in, 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 in chronological order, but I changed everybody's name so that their names were in alphabetical order. And I'm not going to give you all 26 stories that I tell, but I'm going to give you a few of them. I'm going to start with uh, two friends of mine, say Alan and Beth. One of them is an astronomer. The other is a doctor, a married couple. They're in this 100-year-old house, and it's full of toys. Well, okay, they've got two kids, but an awful lot of the, out of the toys are their toys, their techie toys. And 
they're facing an interesting crisis at this point because their kids are about, you know, six and eight. And they're at the stage where they're asking questions and they're thinking, maybe we should join a church. And maybe we should join a church so that we can educate our family in something. Um, but what church? She had been raised Catholic. Beth had been raised Catholic, but didn't like the church and had left it years ago. And uh, Alan had been raised a Unitarian, but he thought, you know, there's really not a whole lot there there for the Unitarians. He thought they were kind of sterile. Um, they they basically, they, they looked into the Quakers. They thought they were maybe a little bit too flaky, too strange. And so I asked them, what are you looking for when you're shopping for a religion and you're a techie? And they were looking for a little bit of both. Alan's got a desire for intellectual content. It doesn't matter what the content is in particular. They're not trying to find the church that's right because they don't think they'll ever know what's right. They just don't want to belong to a church that's obviously wrong. Okay. What do they mean by obviously wrong? So I ask them, you know, what churches do you think are obviously wrong? And remember, this is in California, Northern California, very much, you know, the, the granola and, and hippie milieu. The two churches that they named that they would never belong to as being obviously wrong were Scientology. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a pretty strange religion. And Mormonism. Now, the interesting thing is my thesis director at MIT was a Mormon. There are plenty of Mormons who are scientists. But if you're not in the church, it does look really strange. And so I can understand why people had that opinion. The features that you're looking for when you're shopping for a church depend on the functions that you're asking the church to do. Is the church supposed to bring you closer to God? Then you have to know, well, what are you looking for when you're trying to get closer to God? And the, the techie isn't looking at this in terms of prove to me that God exists. Rather, why should I even bother caring about if God exists? Most techies of my experience are not atheists, but the ones who don't go to church are agnostics, which is to say they don't care. You know, what good is what good is God? It's not going to change anything that I do in my life. I'm a pretty good person. You know, religion is just a device to get people to do good things according to them. That's the way they see it. But there are some techies who look deeper. For some, believing in God is useful because it gives an answer to the classic question that Leibniz, the inventor of calculus, came up with. Why is there something instead of nothing? Why does existence exist? And this isn't just, you know, who started the Big Bang, but why are there laws of physics? Why is there space and time in which a Big Bang could occur? To other people, believing in God is useful because it's a way that you can orient yourself, gives you benchmarks to find out, okay, I want to be better. What does better look like? For some people, believing in God is useful because it's a way to respond to the way you feel at three in the morning and you're lying in bed awake wondering, what am I doing with my life? Why am I here? What am I longing for? And why is it that there's something inside me that's doing the longing? Which incidentally are the, ba are the basic questions of Rahner's book, uh, Grünkos des Glaubens, but uh, I'll spare you the German. A couple of days after I visit Alan and Beth, I visit another couple, Carol and David. Both of them are astronomers. They're at the NASA Ames Research Center, and they have this wonderful home in Mountain View, California, which is a beautiful place. They're a little bit older than Alan and Beth. Their home is, doesn't get filled with toys anymore. On the mantle over the fireplace, there are two framed pictures, two sets of families, her adult kids and his adult kids. So clearly this is a second marriage for both of them. Carol describes herself as a liberal Methodist. David says that he's an atheist. So I talked to Carol, and she says, belief is a way of orienting and structuring her life. 
She goes, believing in God makes me a better person. That's why I choose to believe, which sounds kind of functional, kind of engineering-like. But to both of them, the most compelling reason to believe is that internal urge that makes you look for the transcendent. Even David says, you know, he'll go to church with Carol on Christmas and New Year's, and he gets moved in uncomfortable ways. So, so why is David still an atheist? He says, I was raised a Presbyterian. In my early 20s, I was active in the young adults group. Our minister brought in a rabbi and a Catholic priest to speak to the, a group about their religions. And the rabbi was really good. And the Catholic priest was really good. And our minister was really good. But I thought, they can't all be true. So the only logical possibility that none of them are true. Now, when I tell people this anecdote, most of the non-techies are either amused or appalled by the, the lack of logic. But oddly enough, a lot of techies think that it's a powerful argument. And I can feel the logic of it. Basically, it's saying if you're switching from one religion to another, if you're turning the knob and nothing changes, then the knob isn't con you know, connected to anything important. And therefore, the knob doesn't matter. Therefore, if the choice of religion doesn't matter, then religion itself doesn't matter. Of course, I guess they never turned the knob all the way over to Scientology, where obviously it would matter. But it does mean that the biggest barrier to a lot of techies is not whether or not a religion is true or false, but why there are so many religions. After all, there's only one science, right? And, until you get to quantum physics. And so this is an issue for a lot of my techie friends. It does reflect a fundamental puzzle to the techie mindset. If they're all trying to get you to, to get to know the one true God, why are there so many religions? A little bit later on, I, I talked to a, a professor at Santa Clara University. He's actually an Eastern, Eastern Orthodox. I'll call him Ian. And he teaches a class to engineers that talks about religion using mathematics. And to him, different religions are different series approximations to the truth. In other words, if you're using this mathematical technique of, a, of uh, having an infinite series of terms that add together to try to approach the shape of some very irregular function, some you know, versions of that will converge to the truth faster than others. And so therefore, you know, some religions converge on the truth faster than others. Some of them only get close, close and then they diverge. Notice how he's using techie language and techie experiences to make sense of the religious world. A few days later, I uh, go up to Route 101, almost into San Francisco, and I peel off into the, this ordinary suburban house in a suburban street, but there is this VW microbus up on blocks. And sure enough, that's where my friend, uh, I was giving him a, a, a name, Jules, but in fact, he's, he's uh, he goes, professionally by the name Katane, because he's pretty well known in the world. He's a photographer. He's a nature photographer who went to Caltech. And so he has this artistic sensibility along with the religious sensibility. And we can start, you know, sipping tea. I remember going into his house. He said, would you like a cup of tea? Well, of course. He goes to the cabinet, opens it up, and there's 27 jars of loose tea, none of them labeled, but he knows what each one is. And he says, what kind of tea do you like? And I give a name and he, he pours it out. We're surrounded by vinyl record albums, paintings, you know, pieces of artwork signed by the artists. And I'm like, so I'm back in the 60s again. This is great. Except, you know, his beard and my beard are a little grayer now than they were back in the 60s, but never mind. And talking to him, I describe this project and we come up with some techie ideas for why people believe or don't believe in religion and what they're looking for. I mean, idea number one, they can't all be right, so they must all be wrong. That, that's one reaction you get. Idea number two, they are all correct. They're just different descriptions of the same thing. All churches must be true, according to this idea, because 
they're telling you to do the same thing and content equals rules. And if your rule, your churches all come up with the same rules, they must be based in the same content. And I go, okay. Cause I had actually heard that from this other guy. I didn't mention George, I'll call him who had been raised a Catholic and he left the church because there were too many rules. And then he married a woman who was a seventh day Adventist. So now he's a seventh day Adventist. He's got a whole lot more rules than the Catholic church ever did. Okay, number three. This was a favorite of mine. Different religions are like different computer operating systems. They're adapted to different platforms. The religion that's right for you is the one that fits the way that you're wired. You know, the, the choice of religion depends on your personal history, your internal needs, maybe your genetics, maybe the general question of what you're trying to get out of the religion. And so this isn't the same as, as number two that says they're all the same, because it says that for a given person, one religion might be better than another religion, but for different people, you get different choices. And this is a very pleasing way to explain why there's more than one religion. You know, that sounds an awful lot like my friends, the church shoppers. Number four, different religions are different approximations of the truth. And some approximations converge on the truth faster than others. And so in that case, you could say, well, this religion is better than that religion because it gets closer to the truth faster. Maybe. Or you could say that different religions are kind of like the different kinds of physics. Aristotle had Aristotelian physics, wonderfully common sense, but it actually doesn't work. Newton came up and showed all the flaws in Aristotelian physics, and he invented things called Newton's laws, and he invented the, the existence of friction, and he says, you know, every cause has a, has a reaction. And Newton's laws looked really good for a few hundred years until we realized they don't work when you push them to extremes. And now we've got quantum physics or relativity. And, you know, who knows? Maybe someday we'll come up with a physics to replace those. Most people, most of the time, think in a common sense way like Aristotle and never run into the places where Aristotle will trip you up. Most engineers are perfectly happy using Newton's physics. But at the end of the day, it's not true. It's not completely true. It's missing some really important stuff and actually missing some really beautiful stuff. I have to say that's closest to where I come down. You know, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Jesuit. Um, I can tell you which religion I think is the most complete. The one that encapsulates all the good you'll find in the others, but it's, you know, some of those others are just Catholicism light or uh, they'll, they'll get rid of the Trinity because I don't understand the Trinity. So let's just get rid of it. Um, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can get rid of the Trinity that quickly. Maybe you can get by most of the time without thinking about it, but at the end of the day, it's saying something important that you're losing if you don't have it. Well, you know, if you're a Presbyterian, maybe you think yours is the best religion. We could argue about that. But at least it does say that there is an absolute standard. Later on, I noticed another thing about these different choices. Some of those, like one and four and five, might be the choice of scientists because they're looking at the religion that comes closest to the truth. And number two and three are not so much about what religion is true, but which religions work better. And they tend to be the engineers who don't necessarily want to know what works, uh, what, what's true, they want to know what works. And I've got a friend who is, who is an engineer at Fermilab, the place where they you know, do particle physics. But his background is a scientist. He's actually a safety scientist working with engineers. And he's the one who really pointed out to me the difference between engineers and scientists when it comes to this. The goal of the scientist is to find the truth. But with that goal, you come to realize I'm never going to know the truth completely. You know, if I ever did, I'd run out of uh, things to study and I couldn't ask for more grant money. But the more I study, the more I'll know the truth. Of course, at the same time, the more I'll realize there's truth that I didn't know. And the goal of the engineer is just to build something that's going to work. Once it works, your job, you know, might be over. 
uh, or you might learn from your failures. As a scientist, you can't rest on your laurels. But as an engineer, a large part of your job is knowing when to say how good is good enough and not over-engineer the material and over-engineer the stuff so that you never turn in your product. It's kind of a, an interesting thing to worry about. Anyway, um, for this month, two months, I'm talking to students, I'm talking to engineers, I'm talking to young guys, I'm talking to senior executives, theoretical scientists, all sorts of different opinions. And eventually I'm finding this common pattern in the typical techie. The typical techie, by the time they get to high school or the university, they're beginning to have some serious questions about the truth. And usually that's when they start questioning their religion and they find all the inadequacies of the religion that they learned when they were 10 and 11 years old. Of course, the science that they learned when they were 10, 10 and 11 doesn't really work anymore either. They don't quite make that connection that maybe they need to learn a little more theology. And a lot of them abandon organized religion about that time. And then they get a little older. And then they get married. And then they start having a family. And then they start shopping for a church so that they can raise their kids in some kind of system. Usually they wind up going to the wife's church. Not always, but usually. Kind of curious the way that works. But notice this. Even though you may have abandoned a church when you were 18, that doesn't mean you stop wondering about God and wondering about how I fit in with God. These are the people you go you saying, oh, I don't go to church, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Yeah, right. But that's what they say. That's how they deal with it at that age. And just because they're now going to a church at age 40 doesn't mean that they stop questioning. It's just that they keep their questions to themselves. Interesting. The techies who are old enough to be parents are the ones who are most likely to be going to church, not just to get values or truth, because they already have values and truth by the time you're 40 years old. They basically want a church that's not going to challenge them too much. They want to go to a place, with, a place where they can be comfortable dealing with the challenge, with the values and truth, and a place that can pass that on to their kids. They might be skeptical of organized religion, but they do still have this desire to find meaning in their life, figure out what they're supposed to be doing with their lives, deal with those questions of self-identity that keep you awake at three in the morning. Kind of interesting. There are other things about religion that I would have thought would have been more important to techies, but they don't get played up in the way we present uh, religion to techies or to, to people nowadays. For instance, the phrase apostolic succession. I don't know the last time I ever heard that in a church, the fact that the Catholic Church can trace itself back to, to directly, pope by pope, all the way back to St. Peter, you know, and the apostles. You know, that's that, that kind of is embarrassing to mention when you're talking to your Protestant friends. But there was a techie friend of mine who visited me at St. Peter's in Rome, and we're in the gift shop, and there's this big poster there that lists all 265 or however many there are popes in order. And he was just blown away by this. He goes, there's actually one all the way. Well, of course there is. You know, it's the mean value theorem. There's a beginning, there's an end, there's going to be a connection in between. The very fact that there is a traceable succession going that far back was amazing to him. In fact, St. Peter's Basilica itself can be amazing. I had another friend um, who we've described himself not just as a Unitarian, but a fallen away Unitarian. And, you know, he'd stop really having any interest in church or religion. He was in town to use our telescope. That was it. But we went to St. Peter's. You're in Rome. You're going to go see St. Peter's. And we're walking through. I don't know if you've been to St. Peter's. It's one heck of a church. Let me tell you, it's a big, spectacular piece of architecture. And he's looking at it all. And he's getting this funny look on his face. You know, and I'm waiting to hear something you sometimes hear. Oh, all the money they wasted in building this. No, no, that's not what he's saying. He turns to me and he goes, 
the people who built this church, they really believed this stuff. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I mean, I believe this stuff. What's so amazing about that? It moved him so much that when he went back to America, he joined the church, Lutheran church, but he joined a church. Kind of an interesting reaction to it all. The power that you see in a building like St. Peter's, the power that you see in apostolic succession is tied to something else that's really important to techies, and that's authority. Too often in preaching, the, the preacher is too worried about sounding too authoritarianism. You've got to do this. You must do that. And so they're more likely to say, you know, we're all sinners. We're all in this together. We're all searching together. And for a lot of the people, that's, you know, a, a good way to approach it. But if you're a scientist or an engineer, that's not a particularly good technique or technique. Authority carries an enormous weight and respect in the technological world. Because if you're a techie, you're an expert in your bit of science, your bit of engineering. You're like the centurion in the gospel who says, I understand what authority is because I exercise authority. It's also typical, typical for techies, though, who have a rather inflated opinion of themselves. We have a rather inflated opinion of ourselves that they're thinking, you know, what's this guy got that I don't got? Why should I listen to some guy in a dress up in the pulpit who does, probably doesn't even know how to make the microphone work? Ministers who don't give you a reason to listen to them aren't going to be listened to. And if they don't assert what they do have an authority in, they implicitly disrespect the techie whose own sense of self is directly tied to his or her sense of authority. Later on, I'm in Silicon Valley again, talking to a bunch of people. I'm going to jump up a bazillion people past Xavier. We're getting to the end of the alphabet. So he's 28 years old. He says he's an atheist. He works at Apple Computer. So he's no stranger to evangelical sales pitches. He's no stranger to the idea of centralized authority. To him, he looks around at his friends who do belong to churches and he says, ah, they're just doing it for the community. I don't need a community. I don't need a church. And I'm thinking, you know, is that right? Are people just going to church to hear things that'll make them feel good? to uh, have a place where their kids can get educated? Is that really what's driving people to go to church? And he says to me, you know, coming from Apple Computer, he says, what people go into church for isn't what you're selling them. And I go, huh? He goes, yeah, yeah. You think you're selling them truths, but they already think that they know what the truth is. They're not buying truth from you. What you're selling them isn't truth. It's tech support. Tech support. So a priest or a rabbi is just someone who you call in when things are broken or you will you give you a scheduled once a week maintenance. Is that really what's going on? This is about the time that I head off to meet a guy named Julian Orr. That's his real name. And I'm talking about a book that he really wrote. Uh, Julian Orr is an interesting character. He used to work for Xerox, studying the anthropology of office workers, because he's an anthropologist, he's an ethnologist. And he was hired by Xerox to go hang out at corporations that use Xerox machines to find out, you know, what's the cultural you know, setting of a Xerox machine? How could we make machines that fit into businesses better? And what he does, and he actually did this for his PhD thesis, was he embeds himself with Xerox copy of repairmen. Um, you know, he lives with them. He learns how to become one of them. He hangs out with them as they sit around the diner with their uh, pagers waiting to be called in to go fix the machine. He turns his thesis into a book called Talking About Machines, which is great. Um, and he describes how a typical Xerox copy of repairman is given this big, thick of book of how to repair the machines. And it's all based on error codes. Error code 101. This means such and such. You remove the flamus, you put in the, the widget. 
and you turn it three screws to the left. And it's all worked out this way. They don't bother teaching you how the machine works, just how to fix it. But these guys are sharp. They're no fools. And they spend half of their time sitting around in diners drinking coffee, waiting to be called in to fix the machine at somebody's office. And where they go to fix the machine, their boss isn't there, not the boss from Xerox. They're back in the main office. So they're on their own to do this kind of stuff. What they do as they're sitting around drinking coffee together is they start swapping stories. You know, about the time they had to fix the Xerox machine because somebody left a sandwich in the paper feed. Not in the book, but to do there. And they have a bunch of these rough and ready ways of fixing things that aren't in the book, but work better than what's in the book. It's like an oral tradition that they're passing on to each other. And as I'm listening to him describing this, I realize that's what I hear a lot of techies talking about when they deal with religion. They agree with the general goals of a religion. Sometimes they don't have a particularly high opinion of the documentation or, you know, the folks back at the head office. And they're out on their own with nobody watching them moment by moment. And so just like with the Xerox copy or repairman, they may have this unspoken contempt of the people who can do nothing more than, you know, follow the book. But they do have a set of rules that they've invented for themselves to fix things. A few days later, I find somebody who fits this description perfectly. I'll call him Yaz. I'm close to the end here. And he's a scientist. He's very religious. He's very devout. He's a Lutheran, and he belongs to a rather conservative sect of the Lutheran church. He's actually rather contemptuous of the, the, the sect that his mother belongs to because they're too liberal, and he, he, he wants real content. He finds that the liturgy, the Sunday communion, is really important. The one thing that they miss that was important to him that the church didn't provide was when he wanted to get married because he's gay and he wanted to marry his gay partner. So he went to the local justice of the peace, California, that was legal. So here he is, an active, committed, conservative Lutheran trying to live in a permanent, committed relationship because even though his church doesn't accept relationships like that, it does say if you're in a sexual relationship, it should be monogamous and committed, and that's the way he wants to live. Therefore, in his mind, he's following the rules, just like the Xerox copier repairman who's fixing the machine in a way that's not in any book. When I look back at all of these conversations, there's a side to them that finally hits me. It's the commitment that all of these people have to their faiths, whatever they are, which is kind of interesting because, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and we techies tend to be really busy. So what we do is we like to multitask. So if you're going to read a book or you're going to listen to music or you're going to go to a movie, that's times when you can socialize with your friends, but there's also the times when you can contemplate the big questions of life. And so the kind of music you like to listen to might be atmospheric, you know, new age music. The kind of books you read are fantasy and science fiction that have big questions, which also are conducive to reflecting on our own goals and ideals at the comfortable distance of a galaxy far, far away. These are the techie version of meditation and prayer. And they all seem to do it, whether or not they belong to a religion. But that's, you know, meditation and prayer, that's spirituality. What about religion itself? Is it just, you know, another lifestyle choice, you know, Presbyterian versus Methodist, Pete's coffees or Starbucks coffees? The ones who don't believe in a religion probably think that's what it is. I remember... When I was thinking of joining the Jesuits, I showed the literature about the Jesuits to a friend of mine I'd known for years. And she's a techie. She's a scientist, a, a colleague of mine, very bright. And she goes, you know, this actually looks pretty cool, except for the God stuff. This would you know, be really appealing to me. And I'm thinking, except for the God stuff, it's precisely for the God stuff that I 
belong to the Jesuits. It's precisely for the God stuff that my techie friends who belong to a religion choose belonging to a religion over, you know, joining a sports league or playing cards every Thursday night with their friends. That's, you know, as a sense of community. In fact, they all have this hunger for the God stuff, but they also have a very deep hesitancy, reticence, about talking about religion. They think they're the only ones because everybody's told them, oh, if you're a scientist, you can't possibly be religious. They think that they'll embarrass themselves, but they can talk to me. They're not going to talk to their friends for fear of what the friends will think. They're not going to talk to the family for fear of what the family will think. But they'll talk to me because I've got the collar and the MIT ring. When I asked my questions, they knew what I was talking about. I wasn't raising anything new to them they hadn't thought about before themselves. There are a lot of, you know, temptations that come with being a, a techie, too, the sense that I can do it instead of relying on an organized religion. There are a lot of techies who think that, ah, I'm smarter than the rest of the world, and if I'm smarter than the rest of the world, how can I join a church with all these stupid people in it? There are a lot of techies who will want to say that being a scientist is better than being a philosopher, like, you know, um, uh, Stephen <clears throat> uh, Weinberg. I could go on further and further, and I've got wonderful you know, pictures for another 20 minutes of talk, but I want to get back to the whole idea of what it means to be a scientist. Science and religion only seem to conflict with each other if you think they're both closed books of rules, books of facts. That's the way we learned it as kids. And if you stop learning at age 12, that's the way you're going to see it. But a scientist knows that you're not ever getting the complete truth. It just gives you the explanation that has the best odds of you know, working. Like that's why you take the vaccine, because it's not going to cure you. It's not even going to be 100% perfect, but it improves the odds. Religion isn't a textbook that follow the rules and you'll get to know God. Religion is about love and you can never get love by following the rules. Religion requires constant attention, constant exploration, constantly learning about the one you love. One last thing I'll throw at you. Why should we care about technology? Why should we care about techies? Besides the fact that there are a lot of techies in our church. Technology is a social justice issue. Number one, curiosity about the world is a basic human trait. And if you tell somebody, oh, no, I'm sorry, you, you don't have the right to be curious about the world because there's people starving in the world, you're denying that person, their humanity. If you go to a poor person and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to teach you about, you know, looking at the stars because that's a waste of your time. No. They have souls to be fed. That's why you have beautiful churches in poor neighborhoods. That's why you enjoy dance and marvelous food on feast days and wondering about what those stars overhead are because we do not live by bread alone and a church that only feeds the stomach is nothing more than a, you know, an NGO. It's not giving you the God stuff. Technology teaches you how impossibly big problems can be broken down into smaller problems that can be solved. There's social justice. It gives people hope that they can improve the justice in their world. The mechanical view of the world is incompatible with a lot of other things, but that every view of the world is incompatible. Just because techies aren't good at understanding what re retreat directors say isn't the same thing as saying we shouldn't even talk to them. With that, I'll, um, I'll 
end my talk and I'll let myself be open to questions. Are you done? Done with your presentation? I'm done. Now I'm finished. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful presentation and uh, enlightening our minds. You are really an apt person to speak to us as a Jesuit, as a scientist. So it was nice listening to you. You gave us different concepts about God and how science or techies look at it and how we have to treat with them. We have some questions here. Now we'll there is already one question from Mr. Felix Vincent. Can we mix and uh, compare the religion and science? Can we mix and compare or compare the religion and science? This is a question from... I say Felix. that there's a one wonderful way we can compare them. And that is in the social nature of what it is to be a scientist and what it is to be a religious person. Um, in theory, you would think I could um, teach myself all I need to know out of science by reading a bunch of books. But in reality, number one, you can't. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. And number two, science is more than just, um, science is more than just coming up with the right answers yourself. You have to share them with people. It's a conversation with other people. But yeah, the, the idea that both science and religion are social activities that need a whole community of people in order to advance. You may be fed up with you know, organized religion, but there's no substitute for it. The best you can do is to try to make sure that you're not part of the problem and maybe try to work out a way that uh, you, know, you can improve the situation. Just as organized science, big science frustrates a lot of people. And yet, it's also the only thing that's able to get us to go to the moon. In that sense, from the social sense, I see a great connection. But what I don't see is a way that you can, uh, that a way that you could substitute the one for the other. Because religion isn't built to answer temporary problems. That's not what it's about. It's about you know getting us to talk to God, not getting us to talk to our computers. And science is not based on absolute truths. The one thing we know about science is that it goes wrong, which is how it advances. And so it's a terrible thing. You know, the best science of today is going to be the obsolete science of tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Uh, there's one more question from Father Patrick. How do scientists look at death, which is central to religion? How scientists look at death, which is central to religion? Well, most of the scientists I know don't like to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if they do, it's, you know, they're, they're much more comfortable talking about the heat death of the universe than they are talking about their own death. Uh, you do find that... Um, I think the older you get, the more likely you are to be sympathetic to religion. <laughs> but I think that's true of human beings in general. Yes. Uh, On the one hand, you know, the typical scientist is dreaming of a day when technology can give them immortality. On the other hand, they also know the old phrase that every uh, you know, science advances one funeral at a time that sometimes you need the old folks to get out of the field before there's room for the new folks to come in. Uh, we have got uh, the other question in the chat box. Uh, creationism and evolutionism, what is the Roman church's stance? Creationism well, and, yeah. Any kind of ism that claims to have, you know, the full answer to everything is crazy because we don't have answers. We don't completely understand God. We don't completely understand how God creates. We don't completely understand science. Both of them are examples of fundamentalism. One is a kind of religious fundamentalism, the other is science fundamentalism. And you usually find fundamentalists who, because they're, they're afraid, because they have no faith in their faith and they think they have to follow the cookbook rather than trusting in the love of God that uh, they're afraid that people won't take them seriously as scientists, that they'll find out that they're, they're faking it. We're all faking it, you know, what's, what's to worry about there? 
rather than saying that, you know, if, if you think that the Bible is a science book, well, every science book that I've got goes out of date within 10 years, and the Bible's been around for 3,000. You're not doing the Bible any, any favors by saying that. If you think that evolution explains everything, um, it doesn't explain love. It doesn't explain beauty. It doesn't explain why it's so much fun understanding how animals evolved. And uh, it's clearly missing something important. You, you wind up shrinking the question to fit the answer that you have. And that's bad science. OK, there's a question from Johnson. Why we just not live science, technology, and religion separate? We do not have complete uh, knowledge of any of these. That's a, a common answer to it. Some people call them, I think it was Stephen Jay Gould had the phrase, non-overlapping magisteria. The trouble is that they do overlap. They overlap in me. I'm the human being who has to choose how I'm going to live my religious life. And I have to choose how I'm going to understand the physical world that I'm in. And I can't just say that they don't talk to each other. I can say they give me different answers to different kinds of questions, but each supports the other. Pope John Paul II put it beautifully. He says, you know, religion can, uh, can keep science from false absolutes, and science can keep religion from superstition. Because there is this temptation in everything we do to lean towards the easy answer. And having a second point of view pulls us back from that easy answer and says, wait a minute, I don't know everything. I don't know at all. Plus, it's a whole lot more fun. When I see the physical universe as a creation of God, then my doing science is also an act of worship because it's me getting closer to God. When I see God as someone who has made a universe that is free to evolve, that is good to study, that has no nature God screwing things up for me, then I have the courage to look for laws of nature and to think that the universe not only can be explained, but is worth being ex explained. So really, each needs the other. Yeah, we have got a, maybe a uh, comment from Chitra. Uh, it is very difficult to convince someone who is not in faith. They deny everything. They find everything to remain in their reason. Uh, and if they have some scientific stuff to prove, people who are not firm often fall prey to this because they could prove those concrete facts and think the existential matters are all abstract and cannot be proven. Right. Uh, this is just a comment. Anything you want to say, brother? Yeah. This? Um, there was a philosopher, Raisa Maritain, who uh, had a really interesting, she was a, a very profound philosopher, but she came to Christianity, she says, not because of any philosophical argument. You cannot prove faith. That's the whole point of faith. If you could prove it, it wouldn't be faith. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. If you're certain, you don't need faith. But what led her to belief was the existence of good. Sometimes you hear people argue about, you know, if God is good, why is there evil in the world? But you can turn that argument on its head and say, if there is no God, then why is there good in the world? What is good? What is holiness? Why is it that it means so much to us? You don't convince people with arguments. You convince people by showing them a way of life that becomes so attractive. They want to know, what has he got that I don't have? Of course, that's a whole lot harder to do. Uh, we have got another question. Plenty of questions are coming on. So there are, it's a very active discussion that's going on. Uh, this is from Maya Philip. Uh, I didn't get one word. Since there is admired pasture, but seemed to be afraid of thinking about science. Why was a picture in your screen share? Ah. You, yeah, there, that was the part of the talk I realized I wasn't going to have time to get to, so I just jumped over entirely. And the point I was making was in the 19th century, there are many profound theologians who were arguing with each other, most of whom are totally forgotten. The real saints were people like uh, Teresa of the Little Flower or Bernadette, sometimes very simple people who knew how to live 
good lives. We should not ever equate ability to do theology or ability to do science with moral goodness. We shouldn't, you know, say there's only one kind of intelligence. And uh, well, I should, you know, listen to a quote from Einstein because after all, that was Einstein's. Or I should listen to a quote from Stephen Hawking because after all, that was Stephen Hawking. There is goodness in people who you've never heard of that can bring you closer to God than any argument that you're going to hear from me. The, and that's something to be that it's important not to forget. Yeah, thank you. Here is uh, one comment from Lancia. Both science and religion are uh, evolving, incomplete. Science cannot address consciousness. Uh, religion is also limited too in many ways. So this is one of the comment from Lancia. You would like to yeah. comment on it? Um, the one way I like to put it sometimes is, you know, science is trying to understand the truth of the universe. The truth of the universe is beyond what any science can do right now. But the understanding part, we can. I can come up with a theory that can be understood by a human being, even though it's an incomplete picture of reality, even quantum physics. So science is understanding, seeking truth. Religion is the other way around. We're confronted with truths. I exist. I'm sensing the existence of a God. I'm seeing the evidence of God's action in sacred history. I don't understand it. So science is understanding seeking truth and religion is truth seeking understanding. Obviously they have things to say to each other, but they're not substitutes because they're out there looking in, in opposite directions. Okay, in that similar lines, uh, from brute force, I think. Does modern science refute religion? Does science have all the answers? That is the question. Oh, he heavens no. Science is not about the, science is not a big book of answers. That's the way that they taught you when you were 12 years old. But I hope by the time you're 20 years old, you know better. Science is about all the things we don't know. Science progresses only by recognizing where it went wrong. And if it never goes wrong, then it never progresses. And so the idea that science proves anything misunderstands fundamentally what science is. Science is a description of the universe and our descriptions constantly get better, but they're never finished because the universe never runs out of things to surprise us with. Yeah. We have uh, another question from Salim. How would a scientist or a techie be religious at the same time when other people would not accept the idea, their idea? So how would this scientist confront these difficulties in their life? At the end, well, how will they try to let others feel uh, the connection between science and religion? Yeah, the, um, yeah but, but the, the phrase God's mechanics, I'm thinking of the scientist as being the mechanics who are and sometimes looking for the mechanics of how God works. So it's a double pun. I think that a lot of scientists who don't accept religion have only encountered a bad version of religion. Scientists who don't believe in God have a real clear idea of the God it is they don't believe in. And guess what? I don't believe in that God either. There are lots of pictures of God out there that I think are wrong and that are well worth not believing in. Um, and so it's up to us as representatives of religion to be sure that we present a religion which is transparent and humble and yet not afraid to insist on the things that we know are true. And the things that we insist on are the things in the creed, not necessarily, you know, how many times you should ring the bell during the liturgy. Yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, Macman has this question. We religious often speak of finding God in all things. Is it same with the scientist or it is a contradictory question? How would you respond to it? Oh, I think that'd be a, the Jesuit mantra to find God in all things is exactly what a scientist is doing. Why do I do the science at the end of the day? I do it because it's fun. I, it gives me joy. And joy is one of the great signs of God's presence. The joy I receive when I understand something in the scientific world is, to me, God 
you know, nudging me and saying, look at that, isn't this wonderful, what I've created? So for me, it's an act of worship, and that's how I find God in my work. Other people find it in other places. Some people are really good at working with the poor. I've tried that. I can do it. The poor would just assume somebody else worked with them instead of me. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for that uh, beautiful answer. Uh, next, again, Lancia has a question. How does the Vatican Observatory engage with the church? Even I was very curious to know more about the work that happens at uh, Vatican Observatory. Can you enlighten us on that? There are a number of ways that we reach out. The, the reason the Vatican has an observatory is to show the world the church supports science. So we do the science that the church supports, but we also have to show the world or else our job is incomplete. Most directly, we write an annual report every year. I'm busy doing that this weekend to submit to the people at the Vatican so they can see what we're doing. We engage in a lot of public outreach like this, exactly like this, so that everybody, you know, all 60 people on this show know about the Vatican Observatory and what's happening here. We also um, run workshops for teachers in, in, you know, in the United States. We've got a workshop. We're trying to organize workshops elsewhere. Um, you can think about, if you've got scientists among your group, to think of a workshop for science teachers in the high schools to come and meet scientists and get a feeling for what the sciences that they do. We invite them you know, from in America to our observatory in Tucson. And it's a place where we learn about how scientists live and how that can be an act of prayer. Um, we write books. I write these articles for the tablet. I appear on YouTube. Everybody, there's a dozen of us, and we each in a dozen ways to our own communities will do a lot of talking about the science we do with the cachet that, the, the, that we have the authority to talk about science because we are actual scientists. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother, for enlightening us and sharing your experience there. We are really proud of you that uh, our Jesuit, our own man, is there at Vatican Observatory and doing such a beautiful work there. Uh, well, we of course, you know that uh, you have a fellow Indian Jesuit here, uh, Richard D'Souza from Goa. Oh. And, uh, you know, you may want to reach out to him sometime. He can uh, also tell you about being a scientist. Yeah. Uh, Salim has a question for you. How can we get your books, brother? Ah, <laughs> Amazon. Or a lot of them are available only as uh, e-books, but that saves paper. Why not? Basically, if you take my name and run it through Google, I'm the only one in the world with that name. I'm easy <laughs> to find. And if you're yeah. not sure which book to buy, buy all of them. <laughs> Two copies. Over to you, Augustine. Over to you, Augustine. Oh, the, oh one last thing, the one last thing I would mention, if you want to know more, I have a website. We have a website, www.vaticanobservatory, all one word, dot org. Dot? Da Vaticanobservatory dot org. Okay. I'll put it in the chat box if somebody can. Yes, Perfect. yes. Yes. Great, great to see all of you here. Thanks for having yes, I me. I think uh, with that, we will close uh, for the session today. Uh, thank you, Brother Owen, and uh, for effectively uh, uh, moderating the session and also uh, taking questions. And uh, a big thanks to you, Brother, for elaborately uh, explaining to us with your, uh, with your own experience of being a Jesuit and plus a, a scientist and from your own perspective and sharing your own insights and uh, knowledge of uh, whatever you have studied so far all, of, uh, all along these years. Uh, so I think uh, with that, we will close. Uh, I think we have had good sharing and interaction. Uh, it's almost an hour and a half. Uh, brother must be tired. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I invite now uh, Brother McQueen to propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, McQueen. It was indeed a joyous time and a enriching time for me to listen to Brother Guy. 
So thank you, brother, for all your encouraging words. So when eating a fruit, remember the one who planted the tree. Yes, my dear friends, it has truly been a memorable and mesmerizing event. I'm definitely short of words on how to express my gratitude to the speaker of today, Brother Guy S.J. Dear brother, it was really inspiring for so many of us to witness something really special. You gave us your time despite your many commitments. May the Almighty continue to bless you with good health so that you continue the good works in his vineyard. I would also like to thank Father Arjun, Conference Delegate for Formation, for always being available and for the motivation he provides. A word of gratitude to all the PCFs, socius, deans of the Juniorate, and rectors of all our major houses across South Asia for being present this evening. Your presence truly made this evening livelier. A big thank you to Father Joshi, the animator of Digital Jesuits, for accompanying us always. Lastly, thanks to all the participants and our well-wishers and the Digital Jesuit team, without whom this evening wouldn't have been possible. Please do continue to be connected with us as we have exciting events coming up for this Christmas season. Do follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for next updates. God bless you all. Good night. Thank you, McQueen, for your words of appreciation and also for the uh, little advertisement towards the end. Thank you. Uh, with that, we close uh, the chapter for today. And uh, once again, thank you, brother, for your time, for your uh, elaborate presentation on a topic. So we look forward to more interactive uh, sessions like this. And uh, thank you one and all and have a wonderful evening.